Hi, it's great to see you again. Let's watch our second interview with Dr. Vasilev. In this interview, we will try to cover endometriosis and estrogen, hormone therapy, menopause, and cancer risks. I hope you find this discussion helpful. Hi, Dr. Vasilev. Thank you very much for coming back to continue our interview and discuss patients' questions. I really appreciate that, and I'm excited to hear your opinions about what patients ask about endometriosis and everything related. Thanks for having me back again. I'm ready to go. Awesome. So in our last interview, we discussed excision of endometriosis and what happens afterwards. And also we started talking about uh, endometriosis after menopause and what happens and the stats and everything. In this discussion, we will, disc we will continue our conversation about endometriosis after menopause. Then we uh, talk about some questions that patients had about hormonal therapy and their adverse effects on body. And then at the end, we will discuss some questions about endometriosis and cancer. And if you're ready, we can kick it off and start talking about patients' questions. Sounds great, let's go. Awesome, great. Um, so the next question is, um, so after a woman goes into menopause, and if that woman has endometriosis, we always say that there are still estrogen in the body. Where does that estrogen come from if, there, if it's not coming from the ovaries or if that woman is in menopause state? Sure, that's a, it's kind of a complex answer, so bear with me. But um, first, before answering that, I have to say that people think of estrogen as kind of being on or off. And to some degree, you know, really large doses of estrogen internally or externally or kind of low doses, but it's really a broader range than that. We really do not know what's called the dose response curve. Um, in uh, when we're treating somebody with something, it means how much does it take of something, uh, medication or whatever, to have an effect? Well, estrogen is the same way. How much do you really need to create an effect? We don't know what that is. So when you have postmenopausal estrogen, you don't necessarily need for other reasons we'll talk about to have as much uh, as premenopausally, but this dose response curve really, again, unknown is very important. Having said that, so obviously around the time of menopause, um, which is a little bit different if you have a surgical removal of the ovaries, but around time of menopause, uh, naturally, the estrogen tapers off. So it drops over years and it may start at age 48 or so or 47, maybe even earlier, and can stretch all the way to 55 or, or a little bit older. The average is around 51, 52 years of age. But during this transitional or perimenopausal time where the periods may actually stop at 51 or so, but you may still have estrogen that keeps going until 55 or so. Beyond that, this is where complexity comes in. Uh, the ovary produces testosterone a lot longer. The hormones in the body get interconverted. So even the testosterone can then get converted to estrogen, which means there's still estrogen around even beyond 55. How much? Not a lot. But do you really need a lot? Maybe not. And we'll talk about why uh, in a minute. So the other is peripheral conversion. Everybody hears about that where other hormones uh, are basically changed over to estrogen uh, from androstenedione and basically androgens, other, other hormones. I alluded to that with the testosterone as well, but quite common to where your fat cells produce uh, estrogen, which is not estradiol. It's a weaker form of estrogen, but doesn't matter. Again, you still have estrogen on board. The more fat cells you have, the more estrogen type you can have floating around in circulation. The other, and this is where the aromatase inhibitors come in, and I think we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. So uh, if you block that, it may reduce it, but again, you may not eliminate it. Uh, another source is xenoestrogens. Uh, some of those are what's considered healthy, like plant estrogens, for example. But again, in higher doses, maybe it's uh, negative. But beyond that, various chemicals, plastics, things you put on your body, cosmetics, things like that, they have estrogen lookalikes that are called endocrine disruptors. They look like estrogen and they convert to or behave like an estrogen and can activate uh, cells that way. 
Um, the other is hormonal replacement therapy, very common. It kind of went away after the Women's Health Initiative because everybody got scared of estrogen replacement. But now it's coming back and a lot of women are on hormone replacement therapy. That's an obvious answer, but clearly something that needs to be uh, considered when you're saying, well, do you have any estrogen? Yeah, I'm taking it. Okay, that's a clear source. Another not very uh, highly appreciated part is regardless of where all these estrogens are coming from, there's something called the estrobolome. I think I touched upon that actually with our last interview, which basically means that, sorry, basically means that we have a conversion of all of the estrogens into other forms of chemicals that are excreted by your body through the stool. And that <clears throat> is um, something that is dependent on how well your microbiome in your body is functioning. So if you have healthy bacteria functioning normally, it gets rid of all that excess estrogen no matter where it's coming from. If it's not functioning very well, you can have excess estrogen in your body after menopause. Uh, local production is another thing that happens. The People think of fat, but that's not it. It can also be formed, uh, estrogen can be formed in the skin and also locally around uh, endometriosis uh, cells per se. And again, I was alluding to at the very beginning of what we've just started talking about, it's not just estrogen on, estrogen off, and maybe not even necessarily the dose of it, but how does it attach to the cells? And that's where the estrogen receptors come in. These are sitting on or in the cells and those can be altered over time in menopause. So for example, they can become more sensitive to estrogen, in some cases less sensitive. This is a active area of, re of research right now, but the point is that there is a, a receptor that has to be active and how active it is in any individual person differs. And again, as you get into menopause, it changes. So it's very complex, a lot of sources of estrogen, clearly that we just talked about, plus the fact that it has to engage with the cell in some way, and that's through the receptors, which also change. Thank you. Considering the fact that some estrogen is made in endometriosis lesions, why don't we just use aromatase inhibitors to block the estrogen production pathway? So, Again, that will not eliminate all of the sources that I just talked about, especially not the xenoestrogens. However, for conversion at the skin or the fat level or even local level, sure, aromatase inhibitors can uh, make a difference. It's, it is a strategy. It has been used on and off. It causes some side effects as well, uh, but not really bad ones. It depends, it's very individual. It depends on, again, how many fat cells do you have? Are you producing a lot of estrogen that you're trying to block? Or if you're thin, you're not really blocking that much and you're blocking some additional uh, potentially at the endometriosis cell level uh, at the expense of having some hot flashes and maybe some negative effects on the bone, but not much if you're taking it for less than six months to a year. If you take it longer than that though, it is an impact on your bone health uh, and potentially ongoing symptoms. But again, I have to back off and say what I initiated uh, talking about estrogen sources. You're not going to turn off all of the estrogen and exactly how much estrogen do you need to turn off before there's a big difference? That's where we really don't know. That dose response curve is elusive. We really, and it's probably different from person to person, especially since the growth signals to endometriosis cells are not just estrogen. Everybody thinks about that as being a kind of an on off switch, but that is not true. Uh, it's certainly a contributor, but it is not the only source. So yes, uh, you can use it to cut out some of the estrogen, but not all of it. What are the adverse effects of aromatase inhibitors? Yeah, so the main, well, the main thing is again, how much are you shutting off? Um, if it's a lot, because you happen to have a lot of fat cells and you're really, and those fat cells remember are producing relatively weak estrogens already. So if you shut down more of all of the estrogen supply that you have, uh, are you uh, endangering your health? 
So what is that? Well, bone health is one thing. So you have to do, you can do other things. So you can take calcium, magnesium, you can exercise. There's a lot of things you can do to try to uh, overcome the fact that you're losing the estrogen uh, effect. Uh, the other is to the actual just symptoms. Uh, so you may have side effects from that, hot flashes. Can you overcome, um, can you overcome those? Yes, you can. There are various medications, uh, which again, now you're getting into medications. So polypharmacy, trying to avoid that. But for example, uh, there are some natural approaches, maybe a very weak estrogen like a plant estrogen may alleviate some of the hot flashes symptoms, for example. So there's ways to ameliorate the effect that you're shutting down even more, more of the endometriosis supplying estrogen. But again, you're, not, you're just not gonna shut down all of it in all likelihood. Uh, and these, generally it's regarded that if you put someone into menopause prematurely, if maybe it's uh, before age 50 or so, there's been removal of the ovaries and you're trying to remove more estrogen, you're really getting to the point where over 10, 15, 20 years, you're probably gonna have very brittle bones, for example. Uh, so also heart health. I mean, we'll talk about that in a bit, but the, the thought is today that estrogen definitely does have a beneficial effect. And so to cut all estrogen out as kind of the, 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 the thing you need to do above all else may not be the best strategy. Again, removing estrogen is not the panacea. That is not the answer. Uh, you really have to consider all factors. And yes, you are, there is a risk benefit and you are getting, the longer you use it, the more risk there is to actually harm yourself, if not at least cause symptoms that are uh, negative and you really don't want to feel. There are a lot of other quality of life symptoms and you're correct that it shuts off all of the different areas. So uh, vaginal health, for example, uh, the younger you are, you may have some estrogen effects still on board and vaginal uh, tissues are more lush. And if you take out more estrogen, there's less and less of that. It becomes very uh, dry. And then you have problems with uh, intercourse, for example. Uh, skin effects, you, you, you look older potentially. So it's not that it's the fountain of youth completely, but estrogen does have all those beneficial effects. Uh, so yes, risk benefit for both health as well as quality of life. Okay, this takes us to the next question about estrogen and hormones. When someone is in menopause, either natural or premature menopause, doctors give some hormones replacement therapy. What are these hormones and what impacts do they have on heart, bone, and cognition? So the hormones that are usually prescribed are, of course, estrogen, uh, various types. Some are, quote unquote, synthetic. Some are bioidentical or look as close to the original form that's produced by your body as possible, but it's an estrogen of some type. There's not as much of a difference as people like to presuppose, but there are some. But that is the main thing, the estrogen. That is probably the, the main, in fact, not probably, it is the main beneficial hormone. The progesterone, which during your reproductive years cycles and kind of balances the estrogen effect is used in addition to the estrogen sometimes for exactly that, for balancing. And that's it. It's not really a potential, not that beneficial of a hormone compared to estrogen, but you need it, for example, um, for risk of uh, uterine cancer. If your uterus is in, then if you take estrogen alone by itself for years, the risk of uterine cancer, endometrial cancer goes up. If you use progesterone as if you're simulating years that you're cycling with both progesterone and estrogen, you reduce that risk a lot. You may not eliminate it, but you reduce it to almost nothing. So it's a balancing hormone. So as far as the estrogen itself, there's no question that I'm, as I've been alluding to, that on bone health, it's a major beneficial factor. Uh, it, it does reduce osteoporosis. Again, there are other things you can do, but it gets even more synthetic beyond just calcium, magnesium, and exercise. Uh, heart, we, knew for a long time that there were a lot of basic science and observational studies that said estrogen helps your heart and your cardiovascular system. 
a lot, a lot, lot of evidence. And then there was this big study called the Women's Health Initiative, which pretty much shot that down because it was a very big randomized study that said estrogen increases your risk for breast cancer and cardiovascular events, and it doesn't really help the bone that much. And pretty much it was stopped early without really looking at the details and it scared everybody. So all of a sudden use of any kind of hormone replacement dropped to almost nothing, which was a, actually a big disservice because now with newer studies and with reanalysis of the Women's Health Initiative, pretty much everybody's saying, wow, we shouldn't have stopped that study that early because it will probably never be replicated. It was so huge. And the reality is that estrogen does have a beneficial effect on your heart and cardiovascular system. And we are just finding out how much because now we have even better insights on the molecular level of what estrogen is doing uh, to reduce your bad lipids and improve your good lipids and things like that. So definitely a cardiovascular benefit for sure that may actually be decreased a little bit when you take the progesterone. So if you don't have a uterus, you don't really need the progesterone and estrogen by itself does uh, only benefit really. Uh, and parenthetically, I'm not sure if we'll touch on this later, but as far as breast cancer risk, the only increased risk when you're combining progesterone and estrogen using only the estrogen um, does not increase the risk. As far as brain, it's very interesting. There's a lot of, a lot of studies also that support estrogen decreasing dementia and Alzheimer's risk, but it's a mixed bag. There's the overall benefit, but there's something to the timing. So if you take estrogen right away, right after menopause or around menopause and keep going, it's one thing. If you initiate it later, something happens to the estrogen receptors in the various parts of the brain to where you can actually have a negative effect if you're re-educating the brain as to using estrogen. So it's kind of a mixed bag, but in general, a positive effect uh, of estrogen uh, as well on the brain. So estrogen is, again, not the panacea on the, on the good side for uh, everything, but it certainly has a lot of benefit and a lot of quality of life uh, things beyond that, as I mentioned, vaginal health and skin health and things like that. We used to give it out like a vitamin, that's probably wrong, but after the Women's Health Initiative, it went to the devil in disguise and that's completely wrong as well. So it really ought to be a measured discussion with your uh, physician to really determine what is the best thing for you as an individual. Removal of ovaries without removing endometriosis lesions is a common practice by many surgeons who are not expert in endometriosis. But if a patient accepts the removal of ovaries to eliminate the source of estrogen, but then she's told to start hormonal therapy to replace that estrogen, that's a very confusing situation. Understandably. And the issue to some extent is that some of the hormone replacement is at a lower dose than what your ovaries produce. We used to give huge doses, but it really got reduced over the years. So to some extent, you are giving less hormone, less estrogen. But again, remember what I said earlier, we don't really know what that dose response effect really is. And so it is confusing. Well, you took it away and you're giving it back. Well, what's the deal? Uh, the reality is that, yeah, you could be feeding the estrogen uh, dependent endometriosis, but on the other hand, in most cases, it's too low of a, a dose to really have an effect. So the general consensus is from all the studies out there that if you take hormone replacement, that is, it will not uh, feed the enough estrogen to cause the endometriosis to grow. Some physicians may differ. It's also going to largely differ depending on what you as an individual have as a endometriosis disease burden. Did you have a good excision surgery, for example? Do you have microscopic disease or are you nursing along obvious disease that's sitting in there becoming more fibrotic over the years and it's just going to get worse even with small doses? So very individualized and uh, that's the bottom line is you really have to look at the individual situation. Many patients in endometriosis community are in menopause state and are receiving hormone replacement therapy. What are the risks of taking hormone replacement therapy in long term? So for short term, the risks are really negligible. Uh, there's not 
much that I can think of. There are a few people that have increased risk of blood clotting disorders or something. It, again, very unusual for the average person, a short course of, of any of these hormones uh, likely won't have a, a, a major detriment. Long term, let's, let's just say around, it's been studied mostly from menopause on, uh, is there like a maximum period? There was some thought about that. And so there was some temporary activity to where the recommendation was, well, let's just ease people into menopause for five years or so, kind of make sure they don't get hot flashes and then taper it off and they'll be fine and they don't really need it in the long run. I mean, you, you could make that argument and if, if you're really trying to avoid all risk of anything, but on the other hand, you will have the negative uh, effects of having no estrogen or minimal estrogen. But the long-term negative effects really are how you take the hormones. So as I alluded to earlier, if you took only estrogen for a long time for uterine tissue, that estrogen will cause an overgrowth of the uterine lining and eventually will probably become cancerous. So it does increase your risk there. But if you take progesterone with it, that'll drop it to a very low percentage risk of, uh, of getting uterine cancer. So there you almost have to take both. Problem with that is that on breast tissue, it's a completely different effect. The progesterone on breast has a, what they call mitogenic effect, or it stimulates growth. So even from the Women's Health Initiative study, that was the alarm that went up, that when you're using both estrogen and progesterone over a long period of time, it can increase breast cancer risk. But if you take only estrogen, then it does not. So that unfortunately puts you in a kind of a bind if you have a uterus or not. Uh, however, it's probably not a good idea to take long-term progesterone and estrogen together. That may increase the, or does increase the risk. But overall, uh, even the American College of uh, OBGYN no longer says at 65, you should stop all hormonal therapy, which was kind of a tendency to stop somewhere in the 60s. At this point, there really is no upper limit. Um, so it's, it's really a personal decision with a physician. Again, everybody's an individual. You have all sorts of factors that need to be considered. Uh, and the cancer is just one of the risk factors. So as far as the endo, we, we touched on that as well. If you take long-term endo postmenopausally or after removal of ovaries, could that stimulate the growth? Theoretically, sure. But again, we do not know that dose response. We don't know afterwards what that difference in estrogen receptor metabolism is all about in any given individual. We don't know in any individual how much disease do they have when they're starting out. Well, some people do. If, you're, if you come to an excision surgeon and they take everything out and you're down the microscopic, then your risk of long-term estrogen is probably lower than if you started out with uh, quite a bit going into menopause. So, but again, it's still individual. You have to look at the individual situation and, and see if that's a, a problem with, re, with growth of endo. The other little factor, since we're talking about cancer, is there's concern of, well, can you stimulate the endometriosis to become cancerous? In some people with a higher risk, maybe, but overall, there are no good studies that support that. And really, it's just small series that put up a warning flag, which again, just puts it front and center. Everybody's an individual and you really have to look at the risk factors. You have to look at their family history, sometimes genetic testing, things like that. But on average for most people, it does not increase your risk of uh, endometriosis converting into cancer. With that statement, you guided us to the next question, which is whether or not there is any correlation between any type of cancers with endometriosis. Sure, uh, especially as an oncologist, I've seen a lot of people uh, with this exact scenario. So the short answer is yes, there is a link. Um, unfortunately, there are some reputable websites out there that say there's no link. That is just completely untrue if you really look at the data. That's scary. But the good news is that it's still very uncommon. So most people are not at increased risk of uh, endometriosis converting into a cancer, which it can do, or increase the risk of ovarian cancer, which it can do. Um, so there is a definite connection. How much of a connection? Well, we're talking about a fraction of a percent increased risk of ovarian cancer, for example, which is probably the, the biggest concern. 
and there's very specific kinds of ovarian cancer, which are unusual, but they are associated with endometriosis, mainly clear cell carcinoma, which is a, a variant. Uh, but again, very small percentage. Now, that's reassuring, but if you're talking about five to 10 million women having endometriosis out there, then a fraction of 1% is still 10, 20,000 women that might be at risk, small. But in any individual situation, it's a problem. So especially if you have a family history, um, possibly even a long family history of endometriosis, uh, older age group, uh, there's definitely something to talk about with a physician who understands not only endometriosis, but also cancer. Um, the, uh, but this is not just observational data, by the way. It's not like we're looking at epidemiology and saying, well, there's endometriosis and there's cancer and there seems to be a link. There seems to be more people getting. It's not just that. We now have molecular evidence for this. So we know that there are molecular signatures uh, in endometriosis that are very similar to ovarian cancer markers, uh, molecular markers. And so there is that overlap and there's a number of them. So in any given individual, again, especially if there's a family history or genetic risk for ovarian cancer anyway, uh, there may be a, a heightened risk uh, within endometriosis per se. So again, yes, scary, but is very low percentage. So no need to worry for most women, but be aware of it. And especially if you have endometriosis that is just not going away despite best efforts as you get older, definitely need an expert to manage you. Again, somebody that understands both endo and uh, cancer. On the same topic, is the cancer risk higher if we give hormones in postmenopause period? So without endometriosis, uh, actually, it seems that just estrogen alone does not increase the risk of ovarian cancer. Uh, and in some cases, some studies show actually that it's lower. Uh, so there's definitely no cause effect there. Uh, but for the endometriosis, again, there are some small studies what we call series. So there's a collection of uh, patients that are put together in one research paper. And there's a little bit of a flag saying, well, we saw this uh, seemingly increased risk when patients got estrogen. This is not the best science. The best science is where you give half the people the agent, in this case, estrogen, and the other half not, and you see what happens. That would take a lot, lot of people to compare uh, the two and get a real answer. There are no such studies. So we don't know that to be true. It's likely a low risk, um, but you can't say that there is zero risk. Again, this, this means being aware and proactive and speaking with an expert about in your particular situation, could there be an increased risk and is it safe to continue with hormones or not? And the vast majority, the answer is yes, it's, it's fine. You're not gonna increase the risk. Right. Um, so that's a, that's a great answer. And thank you for the detailed answer that you gave to these questions. There is one last question. If patients are seeking advice from a top surgeon about how to communicate with other doctors, either surgeons or non-surgeons around them, when, when they are in their menopause, could be premature or could be natural menopause, and they still might have endometriosis and they have pelvic pain and their life is impacted. But a lot of physicians don't recognize the fact that like from the beginning, they totally dismiss this fact or deny it. How, how would you advise patients to communicate with, the, with doctors to, to convince them that there is a chance that this pelvic pain or these other problems might be because of endometriosis? And endometriosis is a possibility after menopause. Very complex, but people should be aware that this is not a problem specific to endometriosis. It sometimes takes decades, many decades to change practices. And so the fact that in medical school, through residency, through OBGYN residency, and sometimes even to fellowships in some cases, uh, reproductive endocrinology, people are taught this kind of on off switch concept of well, if you turn off the estrogen, even before uh, menopause or before you take the ovaries out, you get rid of the endometriosis, which of course, as we've been discussing, is 
just not true. But because there's all this mass education that focuses on on off, and therefore it doesn't make sense that any kind of endometriosis could be there after there's quote unquote no estrogen, that's a massive amount of education that you have to overturn. And parenthetically, I said decades. I mean, it's already been out there for many years. Dr. Redwine published on this about 30 years ago uh, about the fact that there can be postmenopausal endometriosis. But unless you're an expert in the area, you really, there's only so much you can read and look at. And therefore, if you're an endo patient and you come to your general gynecologist and they see two or three endo patients a year, maybe, they're not focusing on that literature. They don't see that, so they're not studying it. And for sure, they're probably not into the molecular biology. So in a way, sometimes the patients are the educators and they have to pretty much tell the physicians in a way that makes them interested because then maybe they'll educate themselves and understand the, the situation. If you just tell them, well, you're wrong, I read this paper. I mean, there's, you don't wanna set that up. You wanna to try to have a collaborative relationship with your physician. Uh, but if you point some of those out, uh, they may go on to educate themselves a little bit more and probably change their, uh, their approach to things. The other education machine that's out there other than medical school residency, et cetera, is the drug companies that are of course pushing GnRH analogs and antagonists and or LISA and so forth. When you have that massive of a quote unquote education machine out there that are detailing physicians in their offices a lot and saying, here, you take this and you get rid of the endo. It reinforces the concept that no estrogen, no endo. And so because of that, this, this, is, this is a problem that I think this will be more difficult to overcome than some of the other things in medicine that have taken decades to take hold. But eventually uh, it will happen. And for the moment, the best thing is self-education and try to get to the right person that uh, can help you, uh, that does understand these things. Word of mouth between patients, of course. Um, it's sad, unfortunate, but there is a ton of material in the medical world and any given physician who is not a specialist is just not gonna be tuned in to every, they can't, it's impossible. So that's why seeking an expert out that uh, understands all of this is critical basically. So basically this situation is, if someone wants to convince a physician against the belief that he or she might have that endometriosis is not possible in menopause. It's basically going against all the education that this person has received or is receiving from pharmaceutical companies or other educational materials out there. And it's, it's gonna be not an easy task. And your suggestion is don't, the best, the best solution might be seeking an expert who understand them, not trying to change the thought or belief of that person, which is difficult. As you said, that education has been there for forever from the beginning. And that makes perfect sense. Yes, I think that for the greater good, you can try to get that physician to consider educating themselves more about something. They may not be interested because that's not much of what they do, or they may be, and they may change what they do for future patients. So you can be an agent of change, but the more you're arguing with your physician, the more you need to move on to somebody else. Right. Dr. Vasilev, thank you very much. This was such a great discussion. We had two sessions interview together, answered a lot of questions coming from patients and advocates. And I'm hoping that this uh, content and these videos that we created, and we are definitely gonna make a podcast out of it, get to the hand of the right people, providers and patients, and they can benefit from it. Thank you for your time. Thank you.